Um, if you have your Bibles, if you will turn with, with us uh, to Genesis 7, that's where we'll be at today. So open up to Genesis 7, that's where we'll be looking at. Also, hold your place there and turn to Nahum chapter 1. That's in the Minor Prophets, closer to the New Testament. Um, Hold your place there as well, Nahum 1, 1 through 8, and then Genesis 7, 1 through 24. Also, if you'd like to follow along with us, if you have the Version app, you can also uh, follow along there. There should be notes that are prepared there that you can, um, if you want to, maybe there's a quote or something you want to look up, it should be, all of our notes should be on the Version app. So Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, says this, the burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkushite. God is jealous, and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and, and is furious. The Lord will, will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is, is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way, the Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are dust of his feet, and he rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before him, and the hills mount, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world of all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue his enemies. If you're coming to church for the first time and you hear these words, maybe your thought might be, man, I didn't even know God was like that. Fierceness and anger and wrath. A lot of times it could be so much easier to talk about God's love. And yes, God is love. Yet God is a God of, of wrath and anger. He's angry against sin. Sin in our life. This passage just to kind of give us the, the context of what's going on here in, uh, in Nahum, who was a prophet of the Lord, that this passage is re- referring to the, the judgment that was to come on Assyria and Nineveh. Nahum is, is here speaking the, the word of the Lord to them. Now this was, was after Jonah, if you remember Jonah, the prophet who God had called to go to Nineveh, and remember, what did, what did Jonah do? He actually went the opposite way and tried to, to do his own thing, but yet God had, had miraculously and sovereignly called him and he finds himself in a, in a whale. Well, this was the, 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 the time after this, this that had happened. Jonah had preached to Nineveh and Jonah had called them to repent. And even though, even though Jonah was reluctant in doing so, God had spared the nation. But here, later on in history, we find also Nahum speaking to this people of the judgment that was coming upon this nation because of its persistent evil and and wickedness. We know that the people did not pay attention this time to Nahum's warning, and actually destruction came upon this this nation in 612 BC. One thing that, that stands out to me as we, as we read the, these, these verses is that the, the Lord is sovereign over His creation. What that means is that God is, is over His creation. God does what He pleases. God is just and righteous. God does reserve His wrath for his enemies and those who who willfully choose to continue in their sin will be judged in his timing in fact there will be no escape 
Another thing that we see evident in that passage is that, is that God is also good. God is, in fact, slow to anger. And God gives opportunity for multiple times to, to turn to Him. He speaks through His people to declare His truth and grace and to declare His, his good news. God uses his, his people to call people to repentance, to, to see that God wants to extend forgiveness and, for, and, and allow them to turn from their, their ways. To shine light on the destructiveness of sin. And to offer a better way through, through Jesus. It's only through trusting in Him that we can be secure in this life and in the life to come. It's through Jesus that we have refuge that we can find security and shelter in. And if you choose to find safety and security in anything else other than a relationship with Jesus, then you are outside the foundation able to endure God's wrath. In fact, you are Susceptible to eternal danger, eternal danger of your soul. It's only through Christ that we can find a relationship, that we could find peace, that we can find love and hope and purpose. The hope that our, our soul longs for and, and needs. It's only in Jesus that, that we can find salvation that leads to eternal life. Removed from the impending judgment that is is to come on this earth. Today we look at Genesis chapter 7 as we see the time had, had come for the flood to come upon the earth. God had had warned Noah about this flood that was coming. In fact, he, he, last week we learned that he gave him specific instructions on how to build an ark and what to do. And it reveals here in this chapter the, the judgment that would come upon the whole earth. And the judgment that came upon the earth in the days of Noah. It also reveals to us the, the safety that Noah and his family found and the animals that went into the ark. Our big idea this morning is God saves the righteous. And judges evil on the earth. Genesis 7 verses 1 through 24. says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark. And you, you and your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven, each of every clean animal, and a male and female. Two each of, of, the, of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. And also seven each of the birds of the air and male and female to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. And for after seven more days I will cause it to rain on the earth. Forty days and forty nights and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood waters were on the earth. And so Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds and of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the seventeenth day of the month, on the day of all the, all, the mount, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. And the windows of the heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah's, Noah and Noah's sons Shem, Ham, and Jepheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with him, entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, and all cattle after their kind, Every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, 
and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark of Noah by two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. And so those who entered male and female of all flesh went in as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now the flood was on the earth forty days, and the waters increased and lifted up the ark. And it rose high above the earth, and the waters prevailed greatly increased on the earth. And the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills and under the whole heaven were, un- were covered. And the waters prevailed fifteen cubits up- upward, and the mountains were covered. And all the flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils were the breath of the Spirit of life. All that was on dry land died, and so he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth, only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that your word has has been preserved for us. Lord, we thank you, God, that everything that we read from it, Lord, is, is truth. Lord, that it's useful and profitable for our correction and our instruction in righteousness, God, it's, Lord, it's able, God, to, to correct our lives. It's able to give us, Lord, your teaching. And it's able, God, to, to speak to the very depths of our soul. So this morning, God, I ask that you would speak to our heart today. Lord, that you would cause your word to become alive in us. Lord, that not only could we understand it, not only could we, God, comprehend its truth, but God, that we can apply it to our hearts today. And so, Lord, we know that you've given us your Holy Spirit to to do that work in our hearts, Lord, the the heart work that only you can do. And so we pray that you would do that work today. Pray that you would allow us to hear your word. Allow our hearts, God, to be good soil for you to work in, God, and for you to produce faith and trust in you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning we'll, we'll look at this passage, it's a, a big passage, but I think there's so much for us to, to glean from it, but we'll look for it, look at it in four different parts today. The first part, the invitation, the response, God closes the door and the flood comes and God destroys and preserves life. Last week, if you're just joining us Today, last week, we've been looking at the life of Noah. We've been going through Genesis for the last two months. And we saw last week how, how Noah was a, a just man. How Noah had faith in the, in the living God. In fact, Romans tells us that it's, it's the just that shall live by faith. And Noah believed God and Noah heeded God's instruction and built the ark exactly how God commanded him to do it. We learn that that faith is, is trusting in God and His Word. It's, faith is, is believing what God has spoken is, is true and is trustworthy and is able to be relied upon. We also learn that that faith is active, that we continue in faith, that the Christian life is not just a a moment in time where we say, yes, I want to follow Christ, and then we go back to our old life and continue doing what we used to do. No, but rather faith in Jesus and the, the Christian life is about continuing. It's about enduring to the end. It's about persevering and we see this example through Noah's life as as Noah for 120 years over 100 years he's building this ark he's 
heeding the, the instruction of God. He's hearing what God has called him to do, even though everyone around him doesn't understand, even though everyone around him is full of unbelief and doesn't believe the promise that, that there is indeed a, a flood coming. But what we see in, in Noah is that he remains faithful to God. Faithful to trust in the promises of God. Faithful to, to heed what God has instructed for him to do. Faith is continuing in God's word. It's resting wholly and completely and relying fully on, on Jesus Christ, who is God's only begotten Son, who God has given for us to put our faith and our trust in. And so today, today we pick up in Genesis 7-1 as we look at our first part, the, the invitation. Look at verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. The time has, has now come for all that God had, had promised Noah was to come. Remember, God did not give man only one day or two days or an hour Rather, God gave man ample time to, to heed his voice. 120 years, it, it, says, it said in, in Genesis 6. It wasn't because he, that God needed that long to make the ark or that God himself couldn't build the ark for himself. In fact, he could have done it all, but yet he chooses one man. To speak to one man who would trust in him, one man who would would have faith to believe in him. God uses Noah to to be this example of, of a preacher of righteousness. And in this time that we, we talked about this, this the fact and the reality is that during the times of Noah, that that the Spirit of God was striving with men. For over 120 years, the Spirit of God was convicting men, drawing men to God, and causing man to see that in Noah, as Noah received the truth, that there was a way of escape. But God would not strive with man forever. There comes a time in in God's economy and in God's time when enough is enough. We we heard about the the times in Noah's day that it was violent, that it was depraved and wicked. And now it's time for God to act. In this we also see that it was during this time that, that man had the opportunity to repent as Noah preached righteousness. Surely men had opportunity to, to heed what God was speaking. It's in God's patience that there is an opportunity to, to turn to God. It's in, a, in God's delay that there is an opportunity for us all to, to turn to Him. To turn away from our ways and rather turn to God and His ways. God is is patient with man. God is is patient with you and me. He wants to reveal Himself to us. He wants to show us the life that He has for us if we are willing to turn away from our own ways and turn to Him. Here in this first verse, we see how God invites Noah onto the ark. I love this this picture. He says, come, come into the ark, Noah, you and all your household, because you are righteous before me, because you trust me. God invites him in. Kind of reminds me of of the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's God who initiates 
our salvation. It's God who starts from the beginning. It's not us. If we have the, the picture that it's us trying to figure things out, it's us trying to, to try and be better. It's not the, the picture of the gospel, but rather it's God that initiates. It's God that comes to us. It's God that sends Jesus to us because we can't do anything in ourselves to save us. And we see, how, we see this picture how God invites Noah to come onto the ark. How great it had to be to, to be welcomed by Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, who made a covenant with Noah that, that he would be safe on the ark, that he would preserve his life. And here it comes into fruition as Noah and his family prepare to go onto the ark. To be righteous, we know that, as we talked about before, that it doesn't mean that we're perfect or with, that we're without sin, but rather it's a, a humble attitude towards God. It's putting faith and trust in God and trusting in God's ways over ourself. It's looking to Him for our needs and for our directions for our life. Hebrews 10.38 puts it like this, Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Faith is active. It's continuous. Faith is about the object. Faith is actually only as good as the object. If our object of our faith is Jesus Christ, then then we have a, a firm foundation for our life. So we see here that Noah continues as he, he's building this ark and he's doing all that God commanded him to do. Noah is giving us this picture of obedience and faith and reliance upon God. Verse 2, You shall take with you seven each of each clean animal and a male and his, and his female and two of each animals that are unclean, a male and female, and also seven each of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all the living things that I have made. Notice it emphasizes it again, and Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him to do. I believe in this, in this passage in, in chapter 7, we get a clear picture of everything that happened. We get more and more details and instruction that God gives to Noah. That there were seven pairs of clean animals and birds that God tells Noah to are going to be coming on the ark. I think it's important that to, to think about why, why is there more, why is there seven pairs of clean animals? Six pairs would, would be used for sacrifice after the flood. There were clean animals that were acceptable to God. And God gives Noah the instruction to bring extra six pairs to, of clean animals. We don't have time this morning to look at it, but Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 gives us more specifics as to which animals were clean and unclean. We know that it was God who had killed the first animals when Adam and Eve sinned and gave them clothing. We also know that as we've looked at the previous chapters of Genesis, that, that Cain, and a Cain and Abel presented a sacrifice to the, Lord, to the Lord. And so we know that this had been passed down to them, that the sacrificial system of, of sacrificing animals. We know that it was God through animal sacrifice was showing us the necessity for sin to be atoned for. In fact, the, the Bible says that without the, the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And all this is, is pointing towards Jesus and the necessity for His sacrifice 
in the Mosaic Law, we'll, we'll, we'll learn and, and you know that this was a part of the, the sacrificial system. And, and it was when Jesus gave his life on the cross that this was the last sacrifice that was necessary for the atonement of man. All this is, is pointing towards Jesus and the necessity for His sacrifice. Look at verse 4. It also says that seven more days were given. One more week for those who, who had not heeded the Lord's warning to believe and to repent. God extends every opportunity for repentance. Noah had, had already done the work that God had commanded him to do, and all the people, all the all the people needed to do was to believe and to walk in the door. But we know that no one else did except for Noah and his family. No one had put their trust in God to enter the ark. No one rather were, were filled with unbelief and trusting God and his promise. It gives us a glimpse of how, how Jesus did all, all the work on the cross. That, it, that if we choose to walk through the door of, of that leads to salvation, we choose to enter the, the safety of God. 2 Peter 3.9 gives us a picture of God's Character. Look, it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is who God is. God is, is patient with us. He is slow to anger. He doesn't want to, to destroy His creation. In fact, Ezekiel 33 says that God doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. But His desire is that the wicked would, would turn to Him, would heed His call, would, would trust in Him for salvation. In verse 5, we, we see once again Noah's obedience here is emphasized. We, we get this almost this picture of of the contrast of those who, who don't trust in God, those who remain outside of the ark, and those who, who go into the ark. Noah was obedient to God, did everything. Noah didn't waver in, in what God had revealed to him. And this is the, the life of faith, the life of, of walking with God, the, walk, the life of continuing in the gospel. Continuing in the truth. Constantly looking to Jesus for salvation. Love watching the Olympics, the long distance running, because I maybe it's just because I like running, but I was watching this last week, and you, I think it was the 1500 meter, and you've seen the, 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 the runner, I think he was from America, that won the race. He was, at the, he was, I think, in fourth or fifth position, but you see how he continues to run until the race was finished. And he actually ended up passing everyone up. He almost, he almost stopped. There was, some, there was some obstruction and one of the guys didn't want to let him around, but he continued to, walk, to run to the end and he won the race. And I, see, I think what a wonderful picture of the, the Christian life. That's what we're called to. To continue walking and continue trusting in God. To continue in God's word and knowing that God wants to to work in our life and lead us to the, to the finish line. And it was Noah who did, did this all the way until it was time for him to enter the ark. Whatever challenges we have in life, we can look to God and know that God is able to, to help us to press on. So we have the, the first part, the invitation, now the, the response. Look at verse 6. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. The first thing that we see here is that the flood happened when Noah was, was 600 years old. And it's something that's reiterated as we look at this section is that this is a, a true historical account. 
Noah was a, a real man. But he lived, in our own, he lived in our world, he walked with God, and he had faith in God. Verse 7, And, and so Noah with his sons and his wife and the, his sons' wives went into the ark, and because of the waters of the flood, of clean animals and animals that are unclean, of birds and everything that creeps on the earth, two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female as God commanded Noah, and it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. And in the 600th year of Noah's life, the second month, the 17th day of the month, on the day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the window of heaven were, op- were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Another thing that we see here that's, that's evident within the text is that is that God is in control of all this. God is in control of everything that is going on. It's God who invites Noah and his family. It's God who's in control of even these animals. I was just thinking about, man, how, much, how chaotic it, it could have been with these animals. It's hard to get my dog to come inside, <laughs> let alone. But we have this picture of all these animals who are obedient to God. I mean, just think of the contrast with the picture. You have the animals who are obedient, who respond to their creator, but you have everyone outside of the ark who are unresponsive to God, who, who don't heed the, the warning of God, but yet these animals come on the ark. And God is, is in control of this all. Love it. It says they go... Two by two, and they enter the ark. David Guzik says this, God never has a problem getting the animals to do what he wants. Only man is more stupid than the animals. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider, Isaiah 1.3. This is the picture that we have. It could be so hard and so easy for us to maybe to not share the gospel. Maybe because maybe you've talked to your friends and you, they don't want to have anything to do with God. Rather, it, the picture is that we should continue. Continue to, to preach the word. Continue to preach the gospel. And allow that work and the results up to God. It's God that does the work. It's God that softens the heart. It's God that draws men to himself. And we're, uh, we're sowers to, to share the good news. And it was after seven days when God had told Noah to get into the ark. And then the flood waters came. And notice verse 7 gives us this picture in, that the fountains of the great deep was broken. And the windows were open. And this, this is telling us of the subterranean waters that sprung up from the inside of the earth. But this happened along with the waters from the sky. We talked about this before, but it's believed that there was a, a canopy that surrounded the globe that was released on the earth. So you could imagine the intense waters, and it gives us a picture later on in this passage. And the rain was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Could you imagine rain like this for 40 days and 40 nights? Number 40 is, is significant in Scripture. It's, it's connected to testing and purification. Think about the nation of Israel when they came out of Egypt. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus was, when he was tempted, he was tempted and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. 40 is significant in the, in the Bible. And it's a symbolic of, of testing and purification. Look at our next part, verse 13. The God closes the door and the floods come. On the, sa- on the very same day, Noah and, his, and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. And they and every beast of after its kind, all cattle, 
after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two of all flesh, in which is the breath of life. And so those that entered male and female, all flesh, went in as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. As we proceed forward in this text, we get more and more details as Noah and his family is mentioned again. Every cattle, every beast, every bird, after its kind, all enter the ark two by two. It's also clear that that it's no one who closes the door but God himself. It's God who is in control of his creation. It's God who, who closes the door. And it's in God alone that that is able to grant salvation. It's the Lord who initiates our salvation. It's the Lord that carries it through. It's the Lord that, that saves us and rescues us from destruction. I love how Philippians says it in chapter 1 verse 6 is, Paul is writing to the Philippian church. He says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. What, what is this telling us? Is that it's, it's God who completes the work. God doesn't save us and put us somewhere and say, All right, you, you figure it out. You try harder. No, the, the picture is, is, that, is that God has, has done this work in our life. If you have been saved and if God has caused you to be born again, that you know that God has done this work and God is, is right there with you to, to carry you through to the finish line. It's God who saves us from our sin. It's God who give us, gives us His Spirit to, to sanctify us. And to cleanse us from our old life and the the sin that maybe might keep coming back. God wants to to cleanse us and to make us a church that is ready for His return. We don't have to worry that that God has forgotten about us. It's God who is able to, to finish the work of salvation in our life. God draws us to Himself. He's he's given us freedom from our sins if you've been saved and and delivered from them. And it's God who who loves us and He's able to complete this work in our life. So what do we do and how do we live? We keep trusting in Him. We keep being filled with the words of Christ. We keep walking in the truth. For what God has begun in us, God is able to to complete the work in our life. And so it's God who shuts the door. Verse 17, Now the flood was on the earth forty days, and the waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose above the earth. And the waters prevailed greatly, increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly, and on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. The picture here is that the idea is that that the flood prevailed on the whole earth. There's some Bible scholars that, that try to say that this was a a local flood. And I have a a hard time seeing that anywhere. And I don't believe that it's accurate to describe that this was a local flood. Everything that we we read indicates that this was a a worldwide flood. Rather, why would would God have Noah build an ark? Couldn't he just have him go somewhere else? And we build the ark because this is a worldwide flood that impacted the whole world. John MacArthur says that the highest mountains were at least 22 and a half feet underwater. So the ark floated freely above the peaks. This would include the highest peak in the area, 
Mount Ararat, which is 17,000 feet high. And that depth further proves it was not a local flood, but a global one. Everything that God had promised Noah would happen, happened. The flood that, that he warned Noah about, that others disregarded, now comes to a, a fulfillment that it impacted everyone who was living during his time. And verse 24 reminds us that, that the waters remained for 150 days. The world may, may think that it knows better. Our world may think that, that they're safe and that they're okay without nothing to worry about, but there is a judgment that is to come. That Christ is coming back. Christ is the, the lion and the lamb. Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah and those who, who have not believed him and made him Lord and Savior of the life will experience the wrath of the lamb. Revelation 6.15 says, And the, the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the commanders, and the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the, in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide on us, for the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who is able to stand? This is describing the, the great tribulation period. There is no one who will be able to endure and stand against God's wrath. It's only in Christ that we can have safety and security for our life. We have the, the invitation, the response, God closing the door and the flood coming. And God destroys and preserves life. Verse 21. And all the flesh died and moved on the earth. Birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And every man and all whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life. All that was on the dry land died. And so he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground. Both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed. From the earth, only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. Those who were outside of the ark fell, the, fell under the judgment of God and his anger towards the sin of man. Those who were inside the ark were safe and secure. It's God and God alone who, who takes life and it's God who preserves life. For Noah and his family, they, they were safe and found refuge in the ark. Noah believed God and he trusted in God's word and, and it was his family who believed what God was, had revealed to him and they went into the ark. Their salvation and their deliverance from the judgment of the flood came by, by God's grace. They could not save themselves. They could not rescue themselves. In fact, they were completely dependent on the mercy of God. It's only through Him that alone that that we can be saved. Jesus took the full weight of, of God's wrath on the cross. In fact, Jesus drank the cup that, that we could never drink. The wrath that our, our sins deserved and the, the penalty of death. So what is left for us to do? John 3, 6 John 3.36 says, But he who believes in the Son has eternal life, everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. 
It's Jesus who, who stepped into our place. It's Jesus who took the, the punishment so we didn't have to experience God's wrath. Have you, have you ever considered how, how good Jesus is? Have you ever thought about the good news that, that he brings into our life? How he changes everything in our life. Our sins and our shortcomings and everything that we do in this life deserves the, the wrath of God, but it's, it's Jesus who, who comes in. It's Jesus who steps into our place. It's grace that comes through Jesus. And it's not anything that we could earn or, or pay for. It's not anything that we could do in ourselves, but rather it's by trusting in His way. It's trusting in Him and humbling ourselves before God that we can be rescued from our sin. It's Jesus who, who gives it freely to us. It cost Him His life, but we can receive it freely. It's Jesus who, who purchased it from with His precious blood. God is, has done everything we need to be saved from the coming wrath that is to come upon the earth. Noah preached righteousness. Noah did everything he could to bring the people in, but rather they chose not to believe. And they, in turn, experienced the wrath of God. And God is in Jesus, giving us everything we need to, to be saved from the wrath to come. John 6, 28 says, Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom you sent. This is the, Jesus had just performed a miracle in, in front of these people. He had just multiplied the bread and the fish to feed over 5,000 people, and these people were more concerned about eating. They come to Jesus and they say, what works do we need to do? And Jesus says, there's nothing for you to do, just believe. To believe on the Son and trust in Him and to receive the, the deliverance and the salvation from sin. And this is what God desires from us that we trust in Him, that we continue to trust and continue to walk in His truth and in His Word. That we follow Jesus, that we continue to receive His life and understand that our, our life is now in Him. If you've been saved, that if you've been rescued from your sin, the, the Bible says in Galatians 2.20 that, that I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but it's now my life is in Christ. And the life that I now live in Jesus, I live by faith. We live by faith. And it's because Jesus who loved us and died for us. So we render our old life crucified and we know that it's in Jesus that our new life is so we're called to believe and to trust in Him that God could save us and rescue us from the wrath that is to come. And I think the valid question for all of us today is, is your life centered on Jesus? Is there something that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do today? Is there something that He is convicting you about? My admonishment is, is to not ignore or reject what the Lord wants to do in and through your life today. As the flood waters came down and the, the destruction that it brought upon every living thing, the only safe place was, was in the ark that God had told Noah to build. And the only safe place for our life is, 
is centered on Jesus Christ. It's only in him that we can find refuge and protection for for our lives. It's only in him that we can have eternal life. Let's pray this morning. So Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and for this, Lord, this picture of of the flood that was that came upon the earth. Lord, we thank you, God, that it's or that your word is given to us, God, to to remember, Lord, to examine our own life, God, to encourage faith in us. Lord, it's your word that, Lord, that we need, God, to bring us back and to remind us of your goodness and your love. And Lord, we thank you, God, that you are a God, Lord, who is patient with us. Lord, that even when we ignore and when we choose not to listen, Lord, that you're patient, Lord, to not give up on us. And so, Lord, my prayer this morning for every person here, Lord, that maybe if there's someone here today who, have ne- who has never put their hope and their trust in Jesus for salvation, maybe this would be the day. Maybe this would be the day that you turn to him and trust in him for salvation. That you turn away and you turn away from your old life and turn to him and repent and receive the the forgiveness of sins and receive the grace that he wants to show to you today. You can say something like this, Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus for me. I believe that I'm a sinner. I believe that I've that I I don't know which way to go, but I thank you that that Jesus made the way. And I believe that he is Lord and Savior and he's able to save me. And so I put my trust in him today. I confess my sins. I Confess that I've never, could never do anything to afford your salvation, but I thank you that Jesus gives it to us freely. Lord, I place my faith and my trust in him today. So we thank you for this today, Lord, that you came to rescue us and save us. And Lord, we put our faith and our trust in you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.